Okay, so I'm going to talk about assembly modeling. I'm going to do something very simple, and then I'm going to move up into complexity. And the first thing when people think of assemblies is modeling bolts, and I'm going to do something very basic with RVE 2s and 3s. So this is being recording, so if you miss something, you can always come back to it. Okay, so I'm going to open Connection Basics, drag this out, let's start out. So this is an old model that I had that I used in my class notes. And you see the mesh is rather coarse, and I'm going to remesh it to start off with, and I'm going to go to Delete Mesh, the method, I'm just going to do it by property, delete all those elements right there. So that gives us our basic geometry. And if you look in the tree, this is very old because it's individual surfaces. And it's a sheet solid. It's actually a manifold sheet solid. And we can go to solid stitch. And I can stitch it all up into one continuous sheet solid, stitched body. And then from there, I could use the, you can see this is curves on surfaces. These are all little panes here. And this is the curves on surfaces. And I'm going to go to the curve washer. I'm going to set the washing washer size to 0.75. And I can pick curves like that. If I want to highlight them, I can hit like that. Those are the curves I want. And that will go ahead and imprint in. Nice little washer. And go up to mesh, size on surface, select all, and I'll set it to 0.5, and I'll set this to 2. And then I go to mesh, geometry, surface, previous, plate. There we go. Much nicer looking mesh from that point. Now I'll go in and set the constraints because the constraints went away. And I'll set it to curve like that. I'll just let it be fixed. So what I'm modeling here is what I'm saying is I have a, a bolt, strange looking bolt. It's a beam element. And I want to attach it here to this hole and I want to pull on it. And it's just a very simple basic connection. And I'm going to put a rigid link from this point out to here. And on that, a rigid link is, is a basic element. I'll bring this up. Type. i got to hide this right in there. You go to the list, rigid. And this is new in 10.1.1, is that you can actually have it created at the center. But we don't. Now, in the default, it's all six degrees of freedom. And if you you can always make it very specific. I'm just going to have a pull in the x direction. And this is going to be a very flexible bolted connection because it's only going to be rigid in the x direction, like that. And there's our, it's, it's a little bit light, that element, but you can go to Modify Color Element. You can make it any color you want. Now I'm just going to go, and now that's already been set up, and I'm just going to am analyze it. And it's finished. I can look at the results. Right click, contour, and right click to form. You can see the prior geometry, and I'll go up here to visibility settings, and I could go all off and just pick element like that. So with that sort of flexibility, you can see how the, the stresses are set up. Now, this is one example. This is with it very, very flexible. Now let's make it very, very rigid. So you go modify, edit, element. And then you can go rerun. You notice that with it flexible like this, it can move and it can bend out on this flange. And we have a deflection of 0.345. So now with it being rigid, 
look at our deflection, it's, it's half, 0.174, and the stresses are at 65. So when it's very flexible, the stresses jump up, and with it very rigid, and this is common when people are doing bolted connections. Um, you, they can throw a rigid link onto it, and you can actually make it too stiff, because what a rigid is, is infinitely rigid. So it's like you're welding a huge, thick steel plate right onto here when you're making it rigid, where in this case, all you're transferring is the X, and it's much more flexible. And, and so when you're using a rigid link, you have a lot of flexibility built into it to what you want to do. Now, this is something new, too, in 10.111. Boy, that's, oh, that's a mouthful. Um, convert. And what it allows you to do, it, it converts it, OK, to convert translational degrees of freedom. So it will go ahead and convert it to an RBE3 with an interpolation factor 1 as a default. And, and honestly, that's the only thing I ever used. Is you can get much more fancier in your ter interpolation factor. But what an RBE3 is, now this is one thing. How do you know you actually have an RBE3? Well, if you go to the FL6 file, you scroll up it will give you a listing of your elements. Number, RBE3, 1. It'll also tell you if you have triangles, 4, and quad. It gives you number C beam elements, 10. It gives you a listing of the elements right there. And of course, if you've been in the analysis world much, you know to look at your O load, which are your loads going in. And you want to compare it to your reaction forces going out, which must be equal. And this is, has to do with the RBE3. It tells you how efficient, you know, what it's doing behind the scenes. So now with that RBE3, look at that. It's 105,000. Because an RBE3 is a force smearing element. Here you have absolutely no rigidity added to the structure. All, it's basically, it's taking the force applied here and smearing it equally all the way around. It's a force smearing element. Now, you don't get any rigidity. So <laughs> I would just say if this beam wasn't constrained properly, it would fly off into space because an RBE3 just does forces, no rigidity. Where an RBE2 does all rigidity and make it very stiff. So what, just a, I'll do this old school. So I'm going to delete that. I'll go to F5, which is here, view select. I'm going to do control E. Well, you see that control E? Let's make a an RBE3 the old school way, like that. And there is a lot. <laughs> this this whole connection technology using it's very there's a lot behind the scenes. Um, if you guys want to know more, send me an email, because I have an old document from another source that, that will mean unknown, course notes, dynamics, connections, finite element connections. I forget where, where I have it stashed. I'm, I'm going off script, so I'm going to stop. But I actually have it RBE right there, RBEs and MPCs. And this thing is 94 pages of everything you want to know about RBEs. <laughs> so, OK, enough on this very old school technology that no one really wants to know about. You think we've gotten past it. But any elegant analysis model will have RBE2s in it and occasional RBE3s. OK, contact. Not everybody is always excited about. 3D contact, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do first as a glued contact, and then I'm going to do it as a thing. And I'm doing it as a plate model. There's thickness turned off. There's thickness turned on. Of course, we have a rigid link down here to do a, to apply the force at the center. Six constraints. This is all set up to go, but I don't have any connection set up. It's just floating. So let's just do a glued connection to 
start off with. The load. I hit defaults when in doubt. Penalty factor, scale factor, things like this. And um, people say, well, how do you how do you understand what's going on on all this? Um, read the manual. It's a lot of stuff, and it's hard to explain. I want to say you really can't force feed somebody and do this, this, and this. Um, it's 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 very transient. It's very light knowledge, and, and people forget. It's like I've read this so many times, and I just see my eyes glaze over. This is I would say this is your first read, and really the second, the more useful read is NX NASTRAN, because that's what we're using. PDF collect collection, user's guide, right here. Look at this, chapter 19. And I've read this a couple times. <laughs> it's still a little dark. And it talks about how NX NASTRAN treats contact. And really, all FE codes treat contact this way. There's nothing new in this world. There's nothing fancy, so to speak. Um, it talks about setting up surface regions, what's a valid surface region, how things to work. And these are plate elements showing the normals. And it talks about offset, contact pairs, and, and how to set up good contact regions, and source regions, target regions. It really explains everything behind the scenes. And if you're going to be doing a lot of contact, it's really useful to read this section. You're going to, you're going to save a lot of time. I know no one likes to read. You think it's a waste. But you, if you're going to be doing it, it will actually save you lots of time. So. I'm going to set this up for glued just because it's very simple. Glued, defaults. This is a search distance. It'll look for, for contact. So this is standard contact technology. First, you define your, your property card, what sort of contact or glued you want. And then you define your, your regions that you want to contact. And I'm using property. And like that. So. I have two regions to go into contact. Then you define the connector, glued. And they try to make it as simple as possible for you. We'll just say contact, like that. OK. So this is a just standard default. I'm not really thinking too much. I'm just running it. Sort of what a new user would do out of the box. You're in a bit of a hurry. Got to get it done. You're just clicking. Then you get a fatal error and anxiety attack sits in. Okay, what do I do? Well, the trick on all this, if you're doing contact, you need to read the FL6 file. No, no one likes to do it. but It says we have something. We gives a node number. Grid point ID is 1730. T1, T2, T3, all six degrees of freedom. Everything's spinning into space. There's like 1730. We look up and it says, OK, max ratio. No glue surfaces found using glue set. Well, how is that? We defined it. We told it what was going on. It just doesn't make sense. Well, if we turn off the thickness, we look at this. And you know, we have a gap. How big is that gap? You know, I have I have these little things right there, and that's just my customization distance. And right click, snap to node, pick that node right there. I just want to see what is the distance in the y direction. Is 0.1. I don't know if you guys saw that, but it was there's a 0.1 gap. So if I go back to my properties. The search distance is 0 0.001, so it can't find can't find what to glue. It's not far enough. So I set it to 0 0.2. Let's go rerun it. Now it worked. If you go to the FL6, double click. Hey, look at that. Between, I know, seems overly large. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit large. It just likes to, 
tell you that, but but it's just giving me all the messages. If you go back up here, the oil load comes out. There's our our, our 500 pounds under T2, and you go down, and there's our SBC Force 500. Everything is fine. Voila, blue connection done. So now let's do something a little bit more interesting. I'm going to go new. I want contact, default, contact. When in doubt, use the default, hit OK. And there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff going on here, and I don't really, how would you say, there's, there's good reading if you're going to get into it. So the regions is already set up, and I'm going to turn on highlighter. Usually, I, I like to I like to name things. Um, when you're debugging stuff, it, sometimes it, a little time to spend up front having a nicely organized model can pay off. Edit, top to contact. Okay, and I'm going to turn everything off. Now let's run it. You see the Vantage is having a small little test model to play around with stuff. You don't have to wait a few minutes. Fatal error. Okay. F6. Double click. You can see, I mean, I had mine. I've expanded mine out, so I think. Let's see what it says. Okay, T3 at grid point 914, T3. Okay, so the model's spinning off into space again. It actually, it did try to make a contact. You know, it tried, but you know, it can't do miracles. It just said, well, look, it tried. It spun off into space in the T3 node 914. And what that node number, it tells you, that's the node associated with the parts that's spinning. So if we go to window, So there's 914. It's on the top tube. So it's telling me that it's that tube is moving into space in the T3 direction. And it's sort of this. I've done it enough. I know why. Because there's no constraint. It's frictionless. And in contact, you could say that it's going to resist the motion in plane here. But since there's no friction, it can slide in and out. So it's telling us that. For this problem to be stable, I need to, I got to have a little friction in the z direction. So now let's rerun it. Okay, now it came back. It ran. Let's see what we have. Well, look at that. That is just absolute garbage. 2,240,412, and it moved in. And our deflection is 4.56. Well, let's, let's look into the run log, see what it says. There's our SP force. I mean, it ran, but and the SP C force, but it's just completely cooked. Very interesting, huh? Well, this can happen at times. Um, this is why you sort of you have to inspect your results and, and contact. Um, and because what's going on here is that if we look at Look at this. I'm going to show the normals for the tube. And then I'll go down to here to model. So here's the base tube. There's the base. Bottom tube pointing out. Top tube pointing inward. The normals are not set up correctly to have a valid contact. The plate normals, and where is this? Where is this little gem of information hidden? Because people, you're always calling tech support, and then they, they say, well, everyone knows that. 
Well, how do you? How does everyone know that? Well, that was a hard lesson I had to figure out. There. For contact, what you want are the normals facing each other. That is so the plate elements can find each other. And it's not always bad because it allows you, if you think about it, with the same contact region, you can set up regions to contact and regions not to contact simply by orienting the plate element normal. So now, I mean, it gives you a little bit more functionality. You may think you never need to, you may never need to use it, but you'd be surprised. It's analysis. So, actually, I can do this little trick. I can flip both at the same time. Now, I turn that on. Let's go back to here. Bottom tube is pointing in. Top tube is pointing out. So now the normals are facing each other. I'll see if I did this right. I don't practice this every day. just makes a good example. Okay. Yeah, right click, deform, contour. Now it's 0.6 and stresses are 90,000 and you see this and you say, well, what the heck is that? That looks totally unreasonable. And well, if you look at the deformed style, percent, turn that off. I'm going to do one to one. When you're doing contact, you sort of you need to look one to one. I'll turn on the thickness, and that is the way it should look, just like that. Now, this contact does take into account plate thicknesses. So if you went into your properties, I can just edit it right from here. Right now it's set to 0.1, and we set this to 0.25, and then update the model. I'll actually force this out. And you see, this is the nature of, of contact. You can take a very simple model. And there, here, I expanded it so much, it, it's still unhappy. <laughs> it's it expanded and moved out. Uh, but this is the one, standard contact. And that's still, I'll just undo. Go back to where it was. There we go, nice and clean. Um, okay, there it is. Good. We're from now. Okay. So this is the most sort of contact type tricky behavior, working with plate elements. So let's do something much simpler. I'm going to go back up. and do this little assembly. And I've already done the meshing on it. It's rather crude, but it, it runs fast. 13,000 nodes. I'll close this out. And I've already set it up. I have a rigid link with a beam element through there. And I have no contact set up. It's just, it's just going. So if I run it straight from here, then this is a rigid length set up here, and I have a moment applied and a force going down. There's our results. There's our deformed. Post data. Oh, zero, zero, zero. Because let's go in here. And the pin holds, but no load. Because it's something I, I haven't in load. I didn't give it a load, so 
it always does what you tell it to do, not what you think it's going to be doing. Okay. And with no contact, we have 107,000. I'm going to change the, since we're going to be spending a little time here, I'm going to go post titles right there, label, let's update. Nice and a little brighter, easier to read, 107,000. You can see that's because it's, there's no contact and it's augering in. So there's lots of ways to set up contact. They give you, if you can, you can highlight right here, and you can have it do automatic. And select solids, and there's, there's only two. It's very simple. And we can tell it to do glue contact, and I'll search. And it does, for simple parts, it does a nice job. And it'll tell you down here. Two solids selected. I'm reading out the messages. One connection property created. Two regions created. One. And we know, remember when I did other tube, I did it the slow way. So first you need to create a connection property. Then you create your regions. You need two. And then you do your connections. And so the automatic will, will attempt on easy stuff to fill it out for you. And if we turn on the highlighter, there's one, there's the other for the top surface. You edit and fill this out with the default. Gives you a maximum search distance. Okay, and it assigns your region between the two, and it's completely automatic. So I'm going to undo. You can tell I don't I don't like doing the things automatic. Um, <laughs> First, I'm going to go on contact, hit the defaults. I'm going to leave it at the defaults, like that. And the regions, what I need is I need to create a contact region, top and bottom. And they give you lots of options. You can do it by geometry. You can do it by elements. I want to do it a little bit more complex, because this is not a pure demo. This is supposed to be you know, somewhat how you would, that you would, might need to do it in the real world. This has been in 10 for a while. Is it? I'm going to turn off like that. I'm going to turn off show when selected. So I want to create a region on this base. So I'm going to go new connection region. I'm going to call it base. I want to do it by elements because this is not uncommon. Is it? Sometimes you don't have geometry and you just need to create it on elements, multiple, and. I don't want all these, but watch this. If you guys have been working with pressure loads on elements, you see this face selector box come up. And I'm going to do adjacent faces. I'm just going to have it paved. And it's going to look for all faces that are within this tolerance of 20. It's just super useful command. I use it all the time for pressure loads and stuff. And there. Now, I'm going to turn this back on. See, and there's my contact pat, patch right on that surface. And now I'll turn off base, and I'm going to go to, now you see those are rigid links. Now if we went up to elements here by type, I could turn those off right there. This is, it's really quite useful. You don't have to create groups, you just, you just get in and do what you want to do. It's, it's an old, it's, I think it's faster than working with groups for doing simple modeling operations. Top tube, multiple, select those right there, adjacent faces, voila. Okay, okay turn the highlighter, there we go. I'll turn the model back on, like that. I have a contact. I have my regions. Let's define a connector. Contact. Base. Top tube. Boom. Done. Now, 
Now, in contact, you guys probably know this already, it has to iterate. And so this is the downside on any sort of more sophisticated analysis. It is nonlinear. It, it has to iterate through the solution, finding out how things contact and how things face. And it's, it's behind the scenes, everything is based on facets of your elements. And so it's each little facet you pick has to find a facet on that posing face and look around. And when it finds contact, it then has to distribute the contact forces among the nodes and balance things out. Uh, numerically, it's very complex. And all the codes do it. It's all the same. It's all based on your element facets. And then it takes the facets and figures out what contact is. And it has to smear the forces among all the nodes. And, and uh, it's, you know, the better if you want very clean looking contact behavior, you have to have a boatload of elements because it's all in the facets and it's all interpolating. So to get really smooth, clean looking contact behavior means tons of elements. And it also has to iterate to convergence. And so anytime you, you start thinking you, you have to have contact as a, as a part of your analysis to get the right behavior, oh boy, it just, everything slows way down. And you can see how this convergence here, it's 28, 24, 34. It's starting to bounce around a little bit. Now it's going down to 30. And the default is set to 20. And so it just comes out at 20. And now you can change that. You can set it to 40, 100. And that's all set properties, maximum status iteration to 20. But let's see. A lot of times on contact, it's just a, it, looking at the results. So now we're at 53,000. Here's without contact. See that punch through like that? 107. So, but of course, this is a very thin, thin top. Of course, it's a demo model. So I could get results like this. <laughs> now. The next step is people say, well, I need bolt preload because I tighten things down. And uh, boy, I never use bolt preload if I can avoid it. It's uh, <laughs> why. Here, let me show you. Load, right click. Got to find out where is it. Load, bolt, 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 bolt. load definitions. There we are. I don't use it much. <laughs> so what I did is I went load definition, right click, and this is under the tree. But of course, model, load, bolt preload. But I really I'm trying to use more and more in the tree. Bolt preload. Oh, uh, let's let's say we crank this down. Let's give it a thousand pounds per boat. And you can only apply it to beam elements. So I can just do it by property, bolt, like that. And let's see where how it all works in the world of FE. It creates your bolt load right there. And they actually give you a cool little symbol for it, all off. And uh, there we go, bolt preload. There. Four of them, 1,000 pounds. See the cute little bolt? All on, geometry off. I really like the new visibility. I mean, everything is there. Groups, layers, load constraint, element, material. OK. So now, now let's run it. And be prepared to wait. And to wait. To wait. Because what is it really doing? Well, in a bolt preload, it first has to run a full contact analysis just to get the bolt preload right. Because what it's doing, and this is mechanically correct, is that on your structure, they come along, they tighten up the bolts. 
and there's no there's really no other load on it typically it's done the shop done during assembly you preload up the boats so numerically that's what you have to do you have to first run through a preload and of course you have contact because you're cinching the bolts up against two surfaces so it's like the chicken and the egg you got to have both you can't have the egg without the chicken and so you have contact and then you cinch up the bolts and it runs a full contact analysis so it has to cycle and behind the scenes what it's doing is it it doesn't just boom at a thousand pounds <coughs> excuse me it starts out with a spring it's it puts numerically a spring where the boat is sitting and it 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 tries to calculate the right stiffness for the boat um, and it uses a bolt factor I mean it's sometimes it works great sometimes it struggles and it may not work and where that bolt factor is right here. And that's, that's the default. It just, just sets it up. But sometimes the bolt factor will be too squishy, and it won't work. And they'll give you an error message if they change your bolt factor. But come back here. So it has ran through, and it got down to where it converged. It converged in t 10 iterations, which is good. Now it's starting. Now it has to go through a full another contact iteration with your load, because first it does the bolt preload, and now everything is cinched up in equilibrium. Then it applies your load with the bolt preload. And look at this is a teeny model. This is 1,300 nodes, um, 13,000 nodes. It's teeny. It just turns, 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 turns. Um, but that's that's the nature of the beast on contact. Thinking, thinking. Almost done. That's why it helps to have multiple computers. And fast one. This is running on my laptop. I've uh, for daily use. I've gone just to. If I see him, I'm always somewhere else outside. I've gone to have everything on my laptop, and I have uh, workstations to actually do the real analysis work, and I remote desktop into the workstation. Um, and that has worked out fabulously. Ah, it's run. Um, and that's uh, what I do. is It's something I just see. Here's my PE workstation. There, this is where I run the beast, and it just finished the LS Dyna run, and it has 24 gigabytes of RAM and it's 3.4 gigahertz, and more disk space. And you know what to do with, it. but it's it's great. So I just put all everything beastie on that, and it runs amazingly fast. It's it's a quite amazing how fast the new Nastran is. Um, to switch over. I don't know if, if you guys are running 64-bit systems and you have lots of RAM, this is where you set it up, right there. This is My laptop has a 64-bit, 8 gig, but I, I should switch this over. <laughs> I forgot, right there. That's how you tell it to use the full 64-bit. And this is standard install. This is nothing. This is nothing secret handshake. This is all, all you guys have it. Okay. There, bolt preload, 1,000 pounds, didn't do anything. Um, one of the things to, to, to look at when you're doing contact analysis is, uh, let me turn this off, okay, like that. And um, what you're seeing there are the, you're seeing the, the regions overlaid, like that. As I'm looking at the von Mises, when you're doing contact, they give you things called a contact pressure. And it's good to look at because it tells you, it'll give you a little idea of what's going on behind the scene. There we go. And if, if, it, if the contact pressure looks good, the results will be better. Doesn't that make sense? That's where you'd expect to see it. And you can see our bolt preload. It's, it's getting there like that. And then this is because it's the way it's pushing up, pulling there. And of course, no contact. 
So that's what the contact pressure. And that's standard check you should always look at when you're doing contact analysis. OK, 1015, my last little example. Some people that have seen this model before are going to laugh, like, come on, what are you still doing with that model? But it's a link, and it's, it's such a useful model because you can first you get to hack it up for symmetry, slice because it's, it's asymmetric, and I'm just going to do quarter symmetric. And I'm going to slice it down the zx. And I get to use my magic secret handshake. Well, it's in this box here. I'll hit Control-Z, and, and I can bring up this locator. And what I want to do is I want to split it in the midpoint like that. And then right-click, previous command, select all. Now I want to slice it right down the middle, right here. And right click, snap to point. I'll do this right there. No, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do it like that. I want to actually want to slice it right in the middle of this rib, because that's another symmetry plane. So control Z, yep, midpoint right there. Oh, undo. That was the uh, wrong slice. I want to slice it there, the ZY midpoint. Now, if you don't like midpoint, how about between? And right click, snap the point. I do this just to confuse people. There, that gives me the midpoint. Now, of course, you can delete from the tree. That's what I'll do. I only want one part. We're going to take this part right here. And now, this is our one link. And what I want to do on this is I want to go in and I'm going to slice it. I'm doing a little. What I want to I'll tell you where the where it's going with this. Sometimes you do not want to use an assembly. This is a this is a link and it has a pin on this point here, and we want to push on the pin. And yeah, you could say an assembly that you'd want to include the pin here to get the right behavior of the link, because you're gonna you're pulling on the pin and the load transfers through the pin into this link, and so on and so forth. But really, the easier way is to put a sinusoidal pressure distribution on this surface right here. Because when you're having contact between a pin and a link, you're only, you're only getting if it's frictionless, which is normally the case, well lubricated. You only have forces normal to this surface. You think about it, on a pin being connected, you're only transmit, transmitting radial forces. And the majority of the force is right at this point, because we're pulling in this direction on it. We're pushing like this. So a way to avoid the complexity of doing a contact analysis with all the assembly is you break it down to a piece part analysis. And you guys probably know that standard. And the type of load you want on here is a bearing load. It peaks, it maximizes here, and it minimizes at 90 degrees. And the new version of FEMAP has such a thing. Caps turned, <coughs> excuse me, caps turned on, bearing load on surface. And bearing force. Magnitude, I'm going to give it a 10,000. And the load angle is 180. I'm going to see what happens if I normal to surface. Total load, if I just use the default, I'm going to see what it does. Specify direction of bearing force. Well, I just wanted the X. I could go like this. That's a little fancy. 
or I could just go like that. Now that's a symbol because there's no nodes to go in there, so let's throw on a let's put a tet mesh on there. So we can we can see how the load's going to be applied like that. And this is standard VMAP. It's just give you it hasn't applied a geometric load. It doesn't know how to apply it yet. And you have to go into load, expand. Like that. And there you go. That is your radial load. And if you do a sum forces. it comes up and says 1,000 pounds right there, because that's what we entered. And so it does it very accurately. Notice how it, it resolved it all to the X. It, that is very, very elegant. Uh, let's run it so you can see what it's, what it's actually going to look like. Um, constraints, new. Symmetry. And in my course notes, what I, I use this for is I use it to um, teach people about symmetry and, and, and working on models. Right click, snap to front, because I'm trying to pick that surface right in front. Like that. This is one of the fun things you do with surfaces. You get to do this like there, slam bang. You can pick two with one. It's a little messy. I'm going to turn off nodes and turn off geometry since I don't need to see them. So we've defined symmetry on this plane and symmetry on this plane. So symmetry here is that you're fixing it in the x direction. Symmetry normal here means you're fixing the y. We still have the z degree of freedom that the model's unconstrained. Now, we don't have any load in the z. You can see it's right here. But this is FEA. We still need to have something constrained in the z. So I'm going to go to nodal. I'm just going to pick a node, fix it in the z. Now I can go down here, go to Analysis, Manage, New. And since it's a TET model, I can use the Iterative Solver. It'll, it'll, it's one of those things. On a TET model that's pure 10 node TETs, you can run a million node model, in fact, 2 million node model. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. You can run a 500,000 node model and in a couple minutes, it's, it's quite amazing. So I see here now it's loading the correct solver. Well, the 64-bit solver. There's a interstitial solver converging away. Ah, it's done. It's too fast. Um, if you look in FL6, it'll tell you, give you some things about the solver. Where's the low marketing blitz? Oh, it's not there. Oh, well. Results. Contour. That is what I wanted to show. And if you've been working with bearings for a while, you will know this is what you should see. You're going to see the hot spot here looking at the von Mises. Now, if I switch it around and look at the tensile stress, that is what you have for a bearing. Oh, I've got to pick. That is perfect. I mean, really, that's, that's what you get. So, and it's a lot faster, seconds, without messing around with any contacts. Okay, that is it. That's all I wanted to cover. On uh, for all the various things, everything on contact. Ten twenty-three. Um, what more? This is a recording. It's going to go on the web. Questions. <laughs> Adrian's my staff is just talking. No, they, they know better. They know I never ask. No, wait. There is a question. The trouble is, is, you know, it's like this, this sneaky window here. It's like I'm trying to expand it. 
How did you set up the bolt beam element? Uh, rigid links. And it's all modeling. I, I cheated on it, too. Um, let's throw this in. If I go in, delete all the results. Now, <clears throat> for all you guys that are ready to move on your day and uh, select surfaces, I'm now, I've finished with all content that I had planned. And someone asked, OK, how did I create this? So what I did is I did it the old school way by hand. But if you know, you know I'm an, a fanatical about my APIs. These are all on the web. This is nothing I have specific. I have a spider bolt all in one. And I'll pick the surfaces. Oh, oh did I get the right surface? Yeah, I got the right surface. I'll pick the top. I'll pick the bottom. I mean, I'm using the, the middle mouse button to rotate. And isn't that cute? Select, bolt, select a material, steel. How's that? Completely automatic. That was a, that API took some time to write. But hey, program element 11 has been created. Program completed. But now, if you're not so fortunate and you don't like using APIs, you can do it old school. Control E, new node at center, surface. God, this is why people go blind doing analysis. This is new, this new node at center that creates it automatically. You used to have to use an API. Uh, uh, it's like, God darn it, sometimes when I pick, it just jumps. Nope, that's right. That's why you always have undo. Then I'm doing Control E, which is this. Automatic create element. Control, control E. Now type is a beam. Like that. Bolt. Needs two nodes. You can see I was doing a lot of beams on this model. It's just killing me. And so I said there had to be a better way. I need to do it on API. Then it's a beam element. I got to set it up like this. There. Ha. Huh. How to create a half bolt? Oh, you have a bolt on a symmetry plane, and you have to stick it there. Uh, boy, I've struggled with that. Well, you you, you got to hand create it, so to speak. You you know the area is half, and uh, you just figure out what your section properties should be. Good old mechanics. Um, okay, 10:27, three minutes hostage. Uh, what is going to be the next one? Next one, I want to do hexing. I want to do hex meshing. Um, it's really useful. There's there's a lot to be said for hexing. Um, there's some good things to learn about it. Uh, I, oh, I'm not going to show anything, but so that's going to be the next one because there's a lot of things to tie in on hexing. And then from there, I don't know. I think I might do something on nonlinear. I, I might circle back and do more on plate meshing because it's so fundamental of all the little tricks. And then we I want to do one on API, how you can write your own API. And I'll probably have I'll have Adrian do that because I just don't know. I've been lazy. Please send your comments, questions, anything you would like, send it to me. And uh, but that's it. And I'll have this thing posted probably later on this week onto the website. So I hope it worked out well for you guys. If not, let me know. And uh, have a great day.